All right, we are back with another episode of CXC in the zone. And today's conversation will be about backlogs. The lovely, lovely, lovely backlogs. So hopefully we can get to a point where you will know how to identify you have one, understand how to work through one, and last but not least, the most important, figure out how to prevent one. All right, so today there's going to be a, a really deep, detailed conversation as usual with Jordan, Chloe, Sashin, and myself. And I think we are about ready to jump in. Jordan, how are you today? I'm good. It's sunny and 70 degrees in New York today, so I'm great. Nice. I'm great. 83 in LA. So I'm with you on that. Yeah, it's cooking. AC is on. Tell the people a little bit about you and your background. Yeah, I'm a uh, CX operations manager here at The Collective. I've been helping build and scale small startups for the past six years, uh, most recently at Lattice and Public.com. Nice. Up next, we have Miss Chloe. How are you today? Hey, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Tell good. us about you. All right. Well, first of all, it is a rainy 45 degrees in Salt Lake City. <laughs> so, yeah, so you stay warm and dry over here. But I'm Chloe. I'm also the CX operations manager at The Collective. I've been successfully building and managing customer service teams in a wide variety of industries for about 10 years now. I've learned a lot over the years, and I'm excited to share some of that knowledge and to continue to learn from you guys as well. Yay. And then, of course, last but not least, we have Sashin. Hey, How you um, doing? very good. I am in Miami where it's about to be disrespectfully hot. <laughs> You're in high 90s today. So oh. I have my, yeah, I have my AC pretty much all the time because it's, wow. it's out of control. But yes, I am the CX strategist with this lovely collective and I've been in uh, customer service, customer uh, experience for over 20 years seen good, bad, and ugly in various different roles in various different industries over the years. So I'm very excited to talk shop about backlogs and what happens in these scenarios. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. I have horror stories, but, but I think the first thing that we need to actually do is for people who may or may not really even understand what it means to have a backlog, let's define it for them. So what exactly is a backlog? I would say to me, a backlog is tickets that are older than maybe 24 hours, like 12 to 24 hours, depending on what your SLA is. So anything that's beyond your SLA would be a backlog to me. Okay. Okay. Who else has a definition? A backlog, yeah, there's tickets that are older, and then there's. it seems that there's a never-ending cycle where you are dealing with a volume of tickets that are coming in, and the current pace of work cannot keep up with set amount of tickets. And so there has to be something extra than the usual day-to-day -day monitoring of tickets to understand what's happening. So that's really okay. my definition of a backlog. Can't keep up, basically. Can't keep up. Gotcha. What about you, Jordan? Yeah, I'd agree with those definitions. And I'd say like, there's maybe a couple different types. One is just like a consistent backlog, like not caused mm -hmm. by any volume changes or anything. It's just like you're mounting, like you're getting this insurmountable mountain of tickets that you can't handle. But there's also like external events that can cause a backlog as well that might be more temporary in nature. Like if you like act, like go viral and sell like a million products, like that there could be a good reason for a backlog. So that's like, there's different types of backlogs. I want to make that, that clear as well. That's very true. I've started defining backlog as the pretty much when your workload exceeds your capacity. That's a backlog. But what I think I find most often is that most people don't know their capacity. Um, they don't know what they're actually able to do on a day to day. So when that backlog hits, it's it's very difficult to kind of like zone in on that and realize like, wait a second, we're we're in trouble versus feeling like, oh, let's just run overtime because there's a point in time where running overtime to fix a backlog just runs out. And I think that over time is sometimes like a short term fix for what people may view as uh, temporary. So to Jordan's point, let's say you have a promo, as he mentioned, it did really well. Now people are writing in, they have questions about it or they're calling in whatever channel you use and you don't have enough resources to handle that. That's a short term thing. But if you are in a space where you are consistently getting more 
work than you can handle, that's a longer term backlog. And that might be time, I think, to look at maybe your processes or even the people, depending, like you may need more people, but we always start with process because a lot of times that fixes the issue. That's something that I learned from dealing with like a crazy backlog in my history. Um, but my question for you guys is what have you learned about managing backlogs in a customer service space in previous roles that you've been in. Also, I would love to know what is the worst backlog you've ever seen? Root cause analysis is really something that I immediately start to, instead of getting, because I think that the first reaction, if you are in a reactive space is panic, especially if you're a supervisor or manager, you're like panicked because sometimes these things creep up you don't ha- you don't necessarily have all the answers, especially if you're new to the company or you're walking into a backlog situation. So I think it's very important to get down to the bottom of what's going on. And mm-hmm. like to Jordan's point, figuring out whether this is temporary or this is a long-term problem and then going from there. So in my experience, I it depended on the situation. I've seen where there was just companies that didn't, it wasn't an important, it wasn't a priority. You know, like they just was like, okay, that's just what it is. And you're like, okay, no, (laughs) you're like, it's not okay that you just don't get back to people. It's like, well, we just, you know, that's just how it is. It's like, okay, well, let's try to figure this out. So there was that part that I've experienced where companies just weren't concerned about it. And then there's other situations where there was a miscommunication that caused a humongous backlog. For, you know, and then having to figure out the strategy around how to get around it. So, Volume wise, what's the worst you've seen? I had a client that had a 7,000 ticket backlog. When I was running teams, it was probably like at least 2,000, 3,000 okay. for a couple of weeks. It was really, it was an operational disconnect and it took a while to get that, you know, down to. And with the 7,000, do you know how long people were waiting like the longest you know that was a that was caused by someone their config like they had to bulk response so it was like one of those situations where it's one answer and they basically just manually responded to everybody instead of having to go individual so that was it was an easier strategy to have to to kind of clean up and like when i was working at um the housing authority we had backlogs in the thousands, you know, 11. And this was from our call center that would come in as tickets for us Mm -hmm. that would take weeks because sometimes it was just, you know, didn't, you know, it was, it it ran the gamut on the families and whatever was going on at that time. So it's, yeah, just depends. Okay. Okay. Who wants to go next? The, I want to know, um, what have you learned about managing backlogs and then what is the worst you've ever seen? I think for me, something I've learned is while you temporarily, like as a people, like a CX leader, you can go in and answer tickets as well. Like if you're trying to do that to combat a backlog, it's not going to set you up for long-term success. And it's like really important to get buy-in from like leadership above you that like, hey, I need to focus on how we can fix this. Me answering tickets is a band-aid. It's not a solution. So, and to that effect, I think in terms of biggest backlog, I was at a company that like was very fortunate and like blew up in a good way. And we like quadruple their customer base over like a period of a couple months. But we went from having hundreds of tickets open at the end of the day to like 6,000 tickets open at the end of the day. And it was a team of like seven of us. And so it was, it was a wild, wild time. But when I first started my CX career, it was actually just joined as a CX rep at a video game company. And their backlog of email tickets was a month long. So if you send an email to us, we would not respond for a month. And it was totally a process thing. We, the way they had all of their agents work, they had dedicated phone agents, but then everybody else was managing two or three chats at once and then expected to handle like 50 emails during the shift on top of that. And like, it's just not possible. And so they Mm -hmm. really needed to break it up and have somebody just do emails and just do chat, but they didn't. And so the email backlog just kept growing and growing. And they're, they're like, just answer more emails. That's the solution. And they gave us like chunks of emails that we were supposed to respond to and did not work, did not work. No, it's, uh, I mean, Sashin, why didn't you tell them to do the root cause? <laughs> right? Like, these are the things. We got to get down to what is going on. Well, it's just not like people aren't just going to email just to be like, hey, y'all, it's Thursday. How y'all doing? Right? Like, no, they call with something or they're coming out. You know, they have an issue. <laughs> so I'm important. telling you. I am telling you. Chloe, what you got? 
so I think as you guys know, I've worked with some pretty high volume clients in the past. Mm -hmm. So the worst, two of the worst ones that I've had have been over 14,000 and then over 17,000 backlog. And it comes down to what Sashin was saying is the root cause. And you sort of figure out like your top five issues that you're having, create your processes, and then try and just chip away at it. So the the strategy behind it is doing the processes, you know, training, of course. You got me beat on backlog. The the worst I've seen is 9,000. And at the time I was running CX, we had two channels open. We had uh, phones and we had email. And at that time, what we did was we shut down phones on Sundays to like try to dig out of it. But it was that we were trying to fix what we thought was short term, but this was like the new normal. And we didn't know that it was the new normal. Um, My boss's brother was his chief of staff and he like decided to like shut down phones indefinitely. And that was the right move. I think the hard part for me was that I wasn't thinking along those lines because I'm like kind of too far on the customer satisfaction space. But in order to get out of that one, one of the things that we did was um, mass communication. So a mass messaging to all those impacted to give them whatever it was that they asked for, just so that we could automatically close their tickets and then move on with our lives. That one, that worked. We got out of the backlog. For clients, when we see backlogs, it's usually like, sometimes it's not a high volume. A lot of times it's just a long response rate. I think we've employed all the suggestions you guys have had. Like one was 10 10 days, small team, 10 day response time on average. And we looked at what were people contacting about and then figured out the number, the high drivers, this is bringing in literally all of your points and then specifically put people on chipping away at those and then shutting down live channels right? Because your backlog is usually going to be tickets that are created, could be come from a live channel, could be a voicemail, missed call, whatever the case may be. Okay. What strategies have you guys employed as far as reducing backlogs in your history? I think looking at deflection strategy is key in the company I was working at with where we grew to 6,000 ticket backlog overnight. We had like a chat bot that would kind of do some deflection, but so many of the inquiries from like the root cause analysis that we did were just like basic helps in our article would solve your question. And so we went in and like re- revamped, overhauled the chat bot and it ended up deflecting like 50% of those inquiries that started to come in. So we were able to get those simple things answered by a bot and then leave like the complex issues and like the relationship building types of conversations for the agents to handle. Because nobody wants to answer like, how do I reset my password or like basic, basic things like that. Um, That's true. And so I think deflection is key. And if your help center is also in bad shape, like some people like me, when I'm a customer, I don't want to talk to a person if I don't have to. I'm going to go to the help center first. And yeah. so like making sure that all the documentation is there externally is is key as well. Before I just mess up again, Chloe, <laughs> has it come back to you? <laughs> yeah, it did. Okay, um, go. <laughs> so, uh, to go off of what was jo- Jordan was saying, you know, your documentation, but also I feel like having subject matter experts is really important. So in the in one of the cases that I had, it was for a handbag company. So it was mostly order status, return you know, damaged product. So having experts in each of those categories are really helped. Like, I don't know where to take it from, you know, the first couple of messages, I'm just going to send it to you and it gets taken care of really quickly. So I think subject matter experts is an important component. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Another one I think is doing uh, when you're actually kind of going through customers, checking to see which channels and, and doing merges of mm-hmm. multiple tickets mm-hmm. um, is important because that can quickly cut down on volume because typically when there is a backlog, there's you know customers that keep reaching out with the same problems or different problems. So mm-hmm. instead of having to run into the same customer with three different tickets or five different tickets or they've emailed, called and chatted, it's really coming up with that strategy to say, has this person reached out to us more than once? 
you know, merging all of their inquiries into one and then responding to all of their concerns. Um, I think it just helps with keeping, you know, response times and then also making sure that that customer doesn't escalate any further and putting them in a higher priority status as well. Because when somebody starts to hit all the channels, like it's just going to build up in mushroom. So making sure depending on their issue, their, their status of, or priority of response is, is a, you know, accounted for as well. Yeah, some systems will actually kick the person to the bottom of the queue mm -hmm. if they send multiple emails, which I think is insane. Yeah, we have done that for sure. Like, look up, as soon as that message comes in, you have the message from the customer, check their profile to see what else they have, solve it all in one. You can take care of three or four tickets in one, they're happier. Because I think people forget that when a customer reaches out to a business, they, they don't know that, per they don't know us. They, they just know that they're contacting the business. So they expect that we know everything. I can remember getting messages from people when I was doing e -com specifically, and the customers would say, you're not answering my emails, but you're sending me marketing messages. Totally different group, you know, but they don't know that, right? So we have to know them in a different way, in my opinion. Jordan, you touched on something and you said, that you guys used um, the chat bot and you said, you, if you were the customer, you would prefer not to talk to anyone. Instead, you'd rather you go to the help center and then you would reach out. Okay, pet peeve rant, you know, I do this every time. My pet peeve is when I do actually take the time to call, because let me tell you something, there's a phone call that I need to make about my refrigerator. I know I talk about this every week, it seems. It's still not working, but I need to make this call and I'm dreading it because it's going to be like 20 minutes of my life that I can't get back. And so I don't want to do it. Okay. But today, that's just, that was just a side note. But today I got a message from my credit card company and they said, you know, we need to verify your information. If you didn't request this, call us. Well, I didn't request anything. So I call the IVR picks up and says, what's the reason for your call? I say customer service. We need to know why you're calling so we can get you to the right rep. Customer service. Okay, I'll connect you to customer service. IVR comes back. Can you tell us the reason for your call? I said, you told me to call you. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. At that point, I'm calling you because you asked me to. That was, that was very annoying. And then the fun part, the lady, when I get on the call with her, it was regarding a new card that was on its way that I, I didn't know was on its way. And she says, next time, just call the number on the back of your card and then we can help you. I said, I don't, I don't have it yet. But in the future, I'll do that. I promise. I promise I will. So I think sometimes we have to sit in the seat as, as the people who are building that CX, that customer experience. We have to sit in the seat of the person using all the services that we are trying to introduce just so we can see how much it doesn't make sense. Because if we're making decisions internally that make sense for us, it doesn't mean that it translates to the customer. I think that's like the dark side of deflection too. It's like when the companies make it super hard to contact you. Like there's a difference in making it hard and annoying versus self-serving the customer information that will help solve their issue. It's definitely a balance, but like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's so annoying. And then also the testing. It's like almost sometimes people will put these things together and not test it to make mm -hmm. sure it works as expected. Yeah. And you really almost have to over test and have a period where you're just testing to make sure that it works yeah. and testing out the scenarios. Because just to your point, if you have a text message that goes to a customer, and these are different channels, so the channels mm -hmm. kind of all have to come together, especially in IVR. Yeah. So that text came to you, then it should have been whatever that text called this number, that number should have served the yeah. purpose of that particular inquiry or whatever they were reaching out to customers from, yeah. instead of you having to go to the general, you know, phone service and then ask for customer service. If, especially when you're reaching out to customers, don't reach out to customers and don't have a process around why you're reaching out to them. Even if it's a short term period process, there's a purpose behind reaching out to that customer because you're trying to solve a problem for them and be proactive. So it's a proactive strategy. So you yeah. can't have a proactive strategy and then have them come to the general situation and just you know, now they're swimming in the regular stuff. I'm telling you. You've killed it. You've killed it I'm at that point. You. Yeah. I, I'm telling you. Speaking of being proactive, 
um, and staying ahead of things. How do you go about preventing a backlog situation? I think um, basically preparing, you know, being in the know of if there's something coming down the pipeline that we're going to have enough tickets, right? That's part mm-hmm. that's like one. Having a standard process around what are we considering to be a kind of a red flag of we need to have all hands on deck because we're trying to, we see that there's a problem. So there should be some sort of a protocol around that. That could be, you know, making sure there's a, like an automation to kind of alert everybody if the ticket volume gets over a certain point or if a certain issue starts to uptick, you know, there's an alert. So there's just having a system of awareness, I think, Mm -hmm. about what is considered a warning sign for a backlog to come with the team. And that varies depending on the business and, and of course, your metrics of what you're measuring as response times and stuff. Okay. Who next? I would think to avoid cherry picking because then it just leaves you know unmanageable tickets and they just stay there because no one wants to deal with it so that's a big one i think we got to definitely do one on um do a, a an episode on like workflows uh, that has to happen because that cherry picking thing is very real jordan what do you have yeah i think kind of to sashin's point having a contingency plan like if you work with a bpo can you have a plan like where they scale up service temporarily with a season or whatever or having a threshold of like hey we'll give the team overtime for this temporary amount of time in this contingency and just yeah. having strict rules around that and like time frames of like it's not a permanent state if it becomes a permanent state that's a bad thing and we need to fix our process or like hire or something like that yeah so i i wrote this article it's on medium And I think that the article focuses so heavily on like tactically how to get out of backlogs that it might go because it's all math. Right. So I I talk about like knowing your capacity. So what can you do on a daily basis? The second thing is given your current resources, what can you offer by ways of overtime and when does it become excessive? Because you can only run overtime for so long before people are like, I don't care about the money. I'd I'd rather be happy. So that's one. And then another thing that will, I think, help prevent backlogs is um, knowing, one, your ramp time. So like, not just how long it takes to train a person, but how long does it take to find and fill a position? And then once you get them in and then they go through training, how long before they're fully functional? All of that stuff matters in backlog prevention because you're and you need to be looking ahead at least 12 weeks, like rolling 12 weeks is good. Now I'm talking like everyone has, you know, a workforce management department. I understand that everybody doesn't have that or that doesn't exist anywhere, but you should be looking ahead at all times. So you have to have a forecast and you have to have a marketing calendar. Right. Marketing needs to tell you, and this is to Sashin's point, what's coming down the pipeline. And if they are not telling you that's a problem, someone from CX also needs to test all of those codes. There is a guy, I won't say his name because he didn't give me permission to say his name, but I hope he's doing well. And if he ever watches this, he'll know who I am. I mean, who I'm speaking of. But this was the one I was at a company. Hmm crazy to say, almost roughly eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, which feels like a long time ago. But anyway, he actually just by his, his, on his own wit, on his own abilities, carved out a role for himself where he became the person that marketing went to, to have the codes and everything tested before CX got it. So he, and he could also review the um, marketing materials to make sure that it was customer friendly. And that wasn't a role that really existed, but it was something that he carved out for himself. So I think that having, you know, someone who does that is also very critical to success, in my opinion. So we talked a lot about the quantitative side, but the reality is that backlogs, they make customers unhappy. So what are some ways that you guys have gone about trying to handle a backlog, while also considering customer satisfaction, which... I have to say this, I have to say this. And I go back to this post that Sheen put up on LinkedIn a while back and it was, she reshared it. Someone said, customer, we're not, basically customer service people are not magicians. You cannot make a person wait two weeks to get a response and expect that when they get their, that response in two weeks, they're happy because 
Chloe was really nice to them when she responded. That is not real. So I have to say that it doesn't happen. Nowhere on earth does that happen. But let's talk about it. What are some of the ways that you've balanced? Like, I'm sorry that you've been waiting six years to talk to us, but here you are now. A good uh, tip is if you find yourself in like a mess of a situation, the autoresponder that you should have already kind of, you know, in your, in your system, update it and say things are a little bit on fire. Just be transparent. I think that if you help customers understand where you are, then they are not going to blow up the email anymore. Say, listen, we're, we got your message. Yeah. It's a hot mess right now. <laughs> we are behind. We have these problems. It, and, and like, if you know what the problem is that everybody's contacting about, you can include that there. We know you're con you may be contacting about this mess right here. We're, you know, this is our average response time for this and we'll get back to you as soon as we possibly can. And then, you know, that's the autoresponder. And then another thing mm -hmm. I, I think some people will put in like a consolation, maybe an extra discount or just depending on the service or product, you know, if they're being affected by something, you know, taking those, those kind of liberties and discretions also might help when you're in this type of situation. I like it. I think yeah. that's such a great point. Cause like, say if you go to a really busy restaurant and your waitress just acknowledges you and says like, hey, I'm coming, then you know, okay, at least I'm seen, at least, you know, I'm next in line and I'm gonna be helped at some point. So it's just that bit of reassurance that that even an autoresponder can give. Yeah. Yeah, yep, yeah, totally agree. I think setting those expectations is important and like being human in your response. I will say on the flip side of that, like what not to do, is we're not in unprecedented times anymore. We cannot use COVID as an excuse. Like the amount of, like even this year I call a service team and they're like, due to whatever, the these unprecedented times, like, no, no, like give me, it, it, <laughs> like, I don't know. I think a lot of companies are using it as an excuse continuing and like, you shouldn't use that as an excuse anymore. Like give yeah. a real actual reason. Yeah. I, um, and I, in some strange way, I actually really like getting our clients out of backlog. I know that that is quirky, but it's because I think we're pretty good at it. Like we've gone, we've taken some clients, one we had, I know, 10 days down to four hours response time in two weeks. They didn't hire anybody. So I feel like our approach and the way that we think about the backlog, identifying what's driving it, putting the resources, on that thing, to Chloe's point, creating true SMEs to really like execute on those things. We remove bottlenecks, right? For communication with the client or the customer base, I should say, where it makes sense. I think that we do that pretty well. I wish that I could just say like, here's the blueprint, but the reality is that I've got, we've got to understand what's happening within that company to then determine what their blueprint looks like and that could be very many things. But anyway, we do like to do that, as strange as it sounds. Are there any tips that you guys want to leave? Any, I mean, we gave you a lot of information, but just thinking about any tips and conclusion that you guys want to share with other people who might be heads of CX, you know, managing the head of CX, founders, whatever the case may be, who are sitting in, you know, thousands of tickets right now with tears in their eyes. I would say take a deep breath, breathe. It's not the end of the world. It's not something that's, you know, like it's it's stressful, but you're gonna get through it. And to take some of these suggestions that we have and see if this fits in your situation. And definitely in the future, making sure you have your contingency plan and a standard of what is okay as far as workflow on ticket and managing tickets versus now we have a problem because you don't wanna constantly find yourself in the backlog drama because mm -hmm. it's a bigger problem of just how the system is working all together. So that's what I would suggest. I like it. Anyone else? I think that was great. I think it was great. Yeah. The only piece <laughs> I'd say is also just like, yeah, don't don't be afraid to ask for help. Like if you're drowning, like hopefully like your company has a culture of like people helping out and like yeah, ask for yeah. help when you need it. I will say this though, one of the things that's most fun about a backlog situation is when you ask other people who don't normally talk to customers to talk to customers. 
and the fact that they would rather do anything else on the planet than to do that. It is hysterical to me. It's like, I'm like, why is everyone so afraid of the customer? There was one company that we went into, this was December, 2019. It was a jewelry company. And it was back when I used to go on site occasionally. I don't, I don't do that anymore, but <laughs> at that time it was fine. Went on site, we helped them with their Zendesk. And I think it was like maybe four to six weeks. It was really short. They had, here we go, the best setup. The person who answered questions about shipping issues was the person who shipped the product. I know that sounds crazy. It was so profound. So if you were the one who shipped it, you had to answer questions about any shipping issues. Marketing, answer questions about marketing. And finance answered questions about returns and any issues and anything like that. Customer service for product specialists. And I was like, why doesn't everyone do this? It's genius. Do you know how few shipping questions you would get or issues you would have if they were responsible for replying to their own, you know, issues? If they had to do the research and call, you know, the the courier to figure out what happened to that order, if orders are coming damaged or something's missing, or it would change instantly because it's direct reflection. I'm just saying that's I agree. Really wonderful. Go ahead. I agree. I think that if more people in different departments were in a space where they handled the customer issues and not just hear about it, I think that. And especially if you're a company that considers or holds customer centricity in a high regard, yeah. that is a practice that should be happening. They should be talking to customers. It may be, not be a regular practice. You know yeah. what I mean? It depends on the size of business, of course. But I think that that instead of having these like workshops with customers or like these surveys of, you know, kind of saying things, actually having those discussions yeah. with customers and helping them resolve the issue would do a lot for those departments. I agree with that. I, I love that. I've never seen it again. I've suggested it a few times. You would swear I said nothing because it's kind of like they, it's almost like they're like, what else you got? Because <laughs> that's not going to happen here. Um, anywho, it's always fun to talk about the the wackiness of the world that we live in. Um, thank you guys so much for taking the time today as usual. And for anyone listening, I hope that we were able to help you identify when you're in a backlog, you know, make sure that you have, you're thinking about whether this is short term or long term, and that some of the tips and strategies that we provided will help you to get out of a backlog and make sure you guys show that clip of Jordan saying, I shouldn't be working the backlog as the head of CX because you're just throwing me in the mix and who's, oh, I'll leave you with this. Um, a person, I don't know who said this to me. Someone taught me this though, very early in my career. I'm going to say he said, I don't know if it was a woman or a man, but we'll go, we'll go with he said um, that if you, so imagine that you're in a ballroom and everyone's on the dance floor dancing and everyone is moving in one direction. What you don't realize if you're on the dance floor is that there's a cliff. And as everyone's dancing, people are falling off the cliff. But you don't know that because you're on the dance floor too. So you need to go up to the top, to the balcony and watch everyone dance. So that when they get close to the edge, you can say, hold on, I need you to take a step back. You guys are getting close to the edge, right? So the next time that your boss is saying to you, you should be in the trenches, show that to him or her, to them to say, actually, I need to be watching to make sure that we don't fall over. It's not whether or not you're willing to do it. It's that your skill is different and you shouldn't do it. That's all I got today, though. Thanks, y'all. And as usual, um, I appreciate you guys. Never feels like work. Never will. That is the commitment. And I will catch up with you guys on the next one. Talk to you later.